What's up, everybody, and welcome back to El Practice, where we want to do some good and stuff. So, this is the first video in which I'll be talking about politics and worldview. I know on YouTube and pretty much everywhere else that people really don't care. And I want you to know that I don't care, that you don't care. One of the reasons I started our practice is so I can find the people who do. How about it? So stand back and stand by. It's gonna be a doozy. There is an infinite amount of things that can be said about worldview and politics. So I'm gonna split this up into two videos. This video will explain my worldview and the next video will explain politics, mostly American politics because I'm an American, through the lens of the worldview that I explain here. Makes sense. And these views will be expressed with the El Practice core values in hand. El Practice values Expression, awareness, and growth. El Practice is on a general mission to do good. And and these are all my opinions. So if you have something to say, just say it. And and that's what I'm looking for. I want to spark the conversation and, and move forward. So let's go. All right. Worldview. My worldview is built upon two major things. Science and the ideas of people. So let's start with the fun one, science. I am part of a species that dominates this planet. We dominated this planet by using teamwork, competition, and the ability to think ahead. Observations show that we are on the crust of a mostly molten droplet of rock and metal we call Earth. Earth orbits a relatively ginormous explodey blob of gas that we call the sun. The sun sits on the Orion Spur, a little baby arm of the barred spiral galaxy we call the Milky Way. The Milky Way is roughly half hydrogen gas clouds and half stars. The Milky Way is part of a group of gravitationally bound galaxies called the Local Group. The Local Group is part of a supercluster of galaxies called Linnaeakea. Linnaeakea is one node of many separated by vast voids and connected through narrow lanes of galaxies called filaments. That is where we are in our universe. There are theories out there saying that there are many universes and it gets a little confusing, but that's a little too out there for this video. If you want to see a video on the multiverse theory or a group of theories, let me know. So, how did we get here? This is one question I'm definitely not able to answer myself, so I'm going to have to rely on the work of others to help me understand. And for this type of information, I need credible and reliable sources. One source is Eric J. Chason. He came up with the interdisciplinary idea of cosmic evolution. And what cosmic evolution is, it's pretty much a theory that says as time moves forward, Stuff gets more complex. There's a cool website that explains it. And the hard math behind it is available too, if you dare to look. So let's just take a trip to the website right now and take a look at the arrow of time to get a quick rundown. All right, so I think the easiest way to get to this website is to just uh, type uh, Cosmic Evolution into Google. Boop. There it is. Boop. Let's uh let's full screen this bitch. Oh. Full screen. Oh no. No. There we go. There we go. Good enough. So cosmic evolution from the big bang to humankind. So uh here's the arrow of time. 14 billion years, about the rough age of the universe. Simple to complex, left to right, particulate. Let's click on this, you know, simple things. Subatomic particles, radiation, photons, all very hot, small universe. 
Everything is whizzing around. Time goes by. And the atoms form. You get uh, hydrogen and helium, which forms galaxies. So you get the galactic epoch. Cool word, epoch. And, uh, and here's the black holes, the supermassive black holes. The first stars happen around this time. And you got quasars, which are like my favorite. And, uh, and, and the scientists are kind of confused here. They don't know where the supermassive black holes come from. They, uh, are already there. The farthest back they look, they don't know if they formed from collapsed stars and then merged and made but some scientists say the supermassive black holes are coming straight out of the big bang so so who knows and then uh the next epoch is the stellar epoch you know you get the stars that are made out of hydrogen and helium and they uh they explode and uh they combine the hydrogen and helium to make heavier elements like iron and carbon and stuff and that's that's the stuff that makes planets after, you know, several generations of stars exploding and forming out of the guts of old stars, making heavier and heavier stuff. It's a huge bug on my fucking screen. Uh, exotic stars. My favorite is a magnetar. Um, and then after that, you know, you get planetary planets form out of the, uh, iron and, and all that stuff. And on the surface of these planets, they're going through cycles of uh, hotness and coldness, dampness and dryness, wet, cold, hot, dry, over and over and over again. Wet, dry, wet, dry, hot, cold. And, uh, and the carbon there combines with a bunch of the other elements. The carbon there combines with a bunch of the other elements and, and makes all kinds of chemicals. Carbon is uh, the most versatile element it can combine with more elements than than every other element combined and uh and that's where you get chemicals and proteins and stuff uh, that's where they come from and and given more time these proteins form into cells and the cells start dividing and self-replicating and combining and doing teamwork with each other and becoming more and more complex life forms Eventually, they, they kick up their energy use because there's enough oxygen after the uh, original life forms spit it out and uh, saturated the atmosphere with it. And so it's, oxygen is a, is a higher energy source. So life switches to that. And, and uh, so like things like, uh, you know, reptiles and animals and that stuff forms and eventually we form and start making our own forms of complexity and energy storage and and stuff like that and and uh and it carries on into the future and uh the most complex things there are now we're we're making now we got uh microchips being combined with brains and and you know they're gonna connect that to the internet so just just imagine how complex that is you know and, it, and it's just an undeniable piece of evidence that uh you know as time goes on things get more complex and and we you know where do we come from we are part of of this we are part of this the the natural process of the universe and uh and i find that pretty amazing and and it's kind of undeniable you know the observations are there so so that's my science part of my worldview and uh time to move on to the ideas of other people that i that i rip and combine into my own ideas all right part two my ideas on other people's ideas so here i'm kind of having trouble remembering all the stuff that i thought about so i wrote it down and i'm just going to read off of that but before i do if you have something to say, positive or negative, uh, you want to teach me a lesson, go right ahead, leave a comment. I'm on Twitter too. That's the point of L practice. Generally, I think there are two types of thought. High-mindedness, which is thoughtful and comes at a high energy cost, and low-mindedness, 
which is instinctive, reactive, and comes at a cost of almost no energy. Here, I'm smashing together Freudian ideas of ego, id, and superego. I'm also considering the roles of the prefrontal cortex and the hindbrain. The prefrontal cortex deals with personality, learning, and social behavior. The hindbrain, sometimes referred to as the lizard brain, controls basic instincts like hunger, thirst, tribalism, and road rage. My favorite way to think about this stuff is through the lens of Frank Herbert's Dune. Dune is Frank Herbert's dissection of the human condition. Herbert was often tapped to write speeches for politicians, and I think that says a lot, so I believe there is weight behind his words. In Dune, there is animal thought and there is human thought. Animalistic thought is controlled by fear, idolatry, and other basic emotions. Animalistic thought is doomed to repetitiveness and failure. Human thought can ignore fear and reactiveness. Human thought recognizes patterns and learns from mistakes. Human thought can perform manipulation and prepare for the future. I find great wisdom in this story. In my worldview, I also consider Gene Roddenberry's vision of the future. Yes, Star Trek. It is high-minded. Roddenberry envisioned people would move past their differences, and as a result, they founded a powerful and benevolent union of societies. Essentially, the America of space. You people are even uglier than I remember. <clears throat> if America actually adhered to its supposed values. There are two ways I implement this high-low animal-human train of thought. One way is internally, in myself. I choose human thought. I am aware of and work to reject instinctive low-minded thoughts and behavior. When I sense low-minded things in myself, I try to control them or release them in a positive way, like during a workout or a mosh pit or something. To the extent that I can, I try to be conscious of my low-minded moments. When I find myself in a tough situation, I ask myself, what would a Starfleet officer do? I try to keep an open mind and I don't judge on things like race, creed, orientation, etc, etc. I admit, I do let my primal instincts loose. Everyone has to, but I do it in a way that doesn't harm anyone else. I am not perfect though. Don't think I'm on some high horse. I give into impulse more than I would like, and that's one of the reasons I started out practice. The other way I implement this high-low animal-human train of thought is externally, by using it as a lens to help myself understand other people. In this case, politics. I am not left, I am not right, and I am not moderate. I see the political spectrum as a confining box. For the most part, I see the two dominant political parties in the United States as the same thing. They both want more power and they both serve the dominant financial institutions of the world. Hang on to your pants though, I'll show my evidence later. I believe the main difference between the two parties boils down to sales tactics. Which primal emotions do they appeal to, to convince people to be loyal? And when I look to where the parties differ, to be totally frank with you, to be totally frank, I see weakness and naivete on the left, and all the trappings of a third world regime on the right. More on that later. So in conclusion, to put that all together, my thoughts on science and ideas of other people. I believe what the rigorous process of science has revealed, and I choose to be as good as a person I can be, while acknowledging everyone has at least some low-mindedness in them, including myself. Some people want progress, and work on being aware of their own low-mindedness, and understand the flaws of being presumptuous. To do so requires lots of energy, and leads to a rise of complexity. Other people, I think most people, fail to be critical of themselves and their surroundings, and succumb to tribalism, which can lead to racism, blind hate, etc, etc. These people often rely on intuition and the familiar for their decisions and judgments. To live this way is stagnant, low energy. These are the people politicians take advantage of so they can add to their own power. Progress can only be achieved by constantly questioning everything, 
while reflecting on the past. It takes a lot of energy to do so, but that is the true nature of the universe. Observe, think, and adapt, or be left behind. This is my worldview. And now to apply it to politics. But that will be in the next video. So, that's that.